where are you in UK? So I'm just, I'm actually just outside Oxford. Um, um, I'm sure you know Oxford is kind of about an hour away from London. So, so oh, yeah. southwest. Yeah. I, I, I've been to Oxford uh, for a screening of one of my film at the university. I remember taking the bus, bus from Heathrow and it was a nice long journey. <laughs> Say that again. Sorry, I bro you broke up. Sorry, um, I said uh, I went to Oxford uh, about a year and a half ago for a screening oh, for you? one of my for one screening of one of my film at Oxford University, and I took the bus from Heathrow to um, Oxford, and it was a nice long ride. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is. A, well, Oxford's very pretty. Very pretty. It's very it, it essentially is. British, isn't it? And um, a yeah. big university town, city. So, um, yeah, and it's not actually that far from London, as you said. Really, it's. An hour, I suppose, maybe a little bit longer if you're on a bus or a coach. It, but yeah, it's it's, commutable, it's not. Sure. Yeah, it's not bad. But I think when you get off a plane after a yeah. red eye, then yeah. you're just completely tired. So I think from that standpoint, uh, it felt like it. But yeah, Oxford is beautiful. I I mean, I remember uh, walking around the university campus. I actually stayed at the campus. It was it was oh, it was you? absolutely yeah yeah it was beautiful. They had some, um, they have some hotels kind of like dorm slash hotel uh, facilities and it was, it was cool it was really good anyways um thank you for joining appreciate it uh good to have you here pleasure thank you for having me on uh i wanted to talk to you about your most recently work and i have a hard time pronouncing this name is it argyle right it is Argyle, yeah. Argyle, I mean, if you yeah. Were, if you were Scottish, um, I think it would be called Argyle. So you kind of accent the G of Argyle. Um, um, but everybody else is pronouncing it Argyle um, with the accent on the A. So um, I, I'm sure however you choose to say it will be absolutely fine. Great. Um, yeah, I, I, one of the things that caught my attention in the film, aside from... You know, overall, I wasn't too crazy about the film, but I did really like the production. I'm just being honest. I'm just no, being honest. Listen, I'm, uh, um, it, uh, you know, uh, I, it's absolutely fine. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, it is fun. It wasn't ever supposed to take itself too seriously. I, yeah. I think critically, you know, Matthew um, never really does films for uh, what, what their critical, critical success will be. It's almost more, a little bit more about the kind of, audience's enjoyment but um yeah yeah I, I, yeah yeah I, get no, I i like matthew's work i mean I, I i have enjoyed kingsman and uh other films i think he did kick ass if i'm not mistaken yeah he did yeah uh, yeah you know yeah. those 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 were great and that's fine i mean we everybody has different tastes but the what i was trying to say was that the production design in this film like that was to me what stood out the most um, it it had its fun moments. It was entertaining, but you know, not yeah. something that you deeply connect with in, in yeah. any way. Uh, no, but you know, before we, yeah. before we before we before we get on to that, I I'm always interested in everyone's journey, how they get to where they are. Um, yeah. I would love to know what your arc has been in terms of trying figuring out what you want to do in your life. You know, if it was. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, what instigated this yeah. bug? So, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't think there is actually a conventional way that people seem to succeed or, or progress in, in, in the film. I, I, I've kind of, I had a slightly kind of strange introduction to it in that I, I didn't want, I actually wanted to be an airline um, and had no interest or even, even really appreciation or, or knowledge that there was a film industry that you you it was a kind of a thing that you could do um and i watched i chosen my a levels which were kind of those the more senior grades here um right um, that would that would suited kind of being an airline pilot so maths and geography i think biology actually so quite like the science um, um and then i watched train spotting this was ah. back in 96, I suppose. 96, I remember, yep. yeah. yeah. And um, uh, which was designed by you know, the, the marvellous Dave Quinn. And I kind of was just completely overtaken by this film. It kind of really did affect me in a way that 
kind of films hadn't I kind of I really started to understand that there was a way that you could enhance the 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 narrative with an aesthetic and you could kind of world build um, these environments to um, to suit the characters and the story and um, it just got me thinking that you know I didn't really want to be an airline pilot and that I kind of wanted to, to carry on trying to tell a story with the aesthetic so I I kind of my mum went to school with um, uh, somebody who knew somebody who was a construction manager who worked in the industry in London. And I kind of, at 18, in a three piece suit, literally fresh out of school, went to meet this construction manager. And nobody wears three piece suits in an art department. Like it was so peculiar. And I, I was so fresh out of school, went there. And it just turned, just happened. It just so happened, sorry, that. Um, production designer who I met at the construction managers uh, in, the, in the office there um, had been to the same school as me like 60 years before I'd kind of graduated um, and um, we kind of we talk we talked about the school and how it had changed and and he was like yeah I'll see you kind of see you Monday and and um, I I kind of I was given an opportunity as an art department runner. I had zero qualifications. I didn't really understand that there was, I know I wanted to be in an art department, but I didn't know what an art department was or what it looked like or how it is. Um, and, and then, and, and, and I've learned on the job, basically. I, I, I haven't been to any of the film, the film schools here or the art schools. I've just kind of picked up knowledge and information as I've kind of progressed through the art department at the different ranks. And I started out in very terrible, television in the UK um some absolute shockers that I'm not well I am proud of but not as proud as I am of Argyle or True Detective for example kind of the, but they they offered me a huge amount of uh, um uh learning uh understanding more about the kind of makeup of the department how how it interacts with the set deck department and construction because it was a big set build um a big a big set build um project uh, set in a women's prison called called Bad Girls. It's um, mm. yeah, it was, it was a, an, an interesting kind of four or five years of my life, and and I got on really really well with the designer, and they kept asking me back to do second season, third season, fourth season. So I kind of worked my way up within the department on this one show, um, um, and that yeah, that's kind of how I got into into it. I mean, actually, curiously, I um, I sent an email to Cave. Um, uh when i was an art director like 15 years after i'd kind of you know seen her work and and used her as inspiration to put me into the industry and wrote her an email and said hey just to let you know back in the summer of 1996 you had no idea but you caused huge eruptions in my in my family in my household i decided having watched train spotting that i would change career path from an airline pilot to the film industry and i just wanted to say thank you and i'm doing it and i really appreciate Kind of what he's done for, for me and, and my career and um and she wrote back and we've worked on, on three or four projects actually since so um, it was really lovely to kind of correct go you know, full circle that's awesome that that's you know that's something that's extremely meaningful to anyone in any industry when you when you get inspired by someone and then you end up connecting you know with them and yeah. then eventually working with them that 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 is that that is that i think that is i don't know what the right word would be but just like a such a big fulfillment that yeah not necessarily like that's it in life but it's just a huge because and it also what it does it boosts your confidence to a level that is unfathomable right so awesome yeah. good for you yeah that's true i hadn't thought of it quite like that i kind of felt like i felt like it i know that if I was K and I had inspired somebody, I would feel really it would be really important to complete the circle. And and you and you're right, it kind of it does feel it could be meaningful. Yeah. Amazing. And what are some of the challenges that you have gone through in your career? Um and I'm not honestly looking for any controversial stuff. Or, the reason I ask you is that in any industry, in, in life in general, you go through struggles, right? Yeah. Um, but in our industry, the struggle is quite real, like, you know, from the standpoint of trying to figure out if you are going to do something that is more creative versus trying to put bread on the uh, food on the table, right? And 
yeah the, in that kind of sense like what kind of struggles have you gone through that people you know younger people who who might be aspiring to be whatever it is including production designer yeah how you know, can the they biggest, overcome that the biggest i mean not the biggest thing and i think probably as as, as i talk about it i think of some other things but you know what right now um actually i feel that there are a huge amount of of um people in the film industry not not working i've got i've got friends and 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 family in it and you know some are having to defer payments to well i for one have had to defer payments to our government to to pay for the taxes i've got friends that are having to go in to speak to head teachers at school and say can we pay for the school fees next term friends are being working in coffee shops and becoming uber drivers um i think i think the writer's strike and then the actor strike has kind of has has sent a lot of people into a tailspin over here um um i think also just all of the kind of the fresh faces and those kind of young graduates that have just managed to kind of navigate through COVID and try and get their head above water to then be hit with the double punches for the strikes. I think a lot of, a lot of people have, um, are questioning whether they want to continue in the industry and those more kind of junior grades. And I think, I think that's, that's, that will be a struggle for us later, but I just, I feel that's really, really sad because I, I honestly believe that what I do, the job as a production designer in certainly this kind of higher tier project the best job in the world it's kind of unfathomable how kind of extraordinary um the places i get to see the things i do the people i meet um um, um i think i think this is the this last this last nine months i think i found myself really having days where i i struggle to kind of get up i feel like I feel like because production design and working in this industry is kind of all encompassing and it is completely an obsession. Um, it it's very difficult for you to kind of, or I find it very difficult to have a, another interest, whether it's spiritual or religious or, or another outlet for creativity, you end up being defined by this as an industry. So when the industry does a nosedive, you really struggle to think, Fuck, my, my life's also doing a bit of a nosedive because I am, because we are defined by this as a as a as an industry. I feel I feel this is what I'm struggling with. Um and there have certainly been days in the last in the last few months where I've been really like struggling to kind of understand a bit more about uh, my identity, who I am because I'm not working, um, and trying to find some kind of motivation to either not necessarily just get up, but just find another another something that can kind of interest me or I can find engaging because I have really learned a lot over the last nine months I need to try and have an alternative thing and that allows me to not only be defined by production design or in film I you know I need I need something else I think so I that's kind of something that I've been struggling with fairly recently I think I think in this industry, there isn't enough support for us uh, and our mental health. I find that budgets are tightening, the schedule is getting, the schedules are getting shorter. What we're, what we're being asked to deliver is, is, is not necessarily um, uh, in keeping with the constraints that we have financially. Uh, I feel like um, this industry is kind of, it's got lots of very, very cool people in and I think certainly in the creative side you're generally a bit more empathetic and I feel like uh, I feel I feel sometimes that um, I'm wearing a lot of a lot of other people's emotions um, and I struggle to deal with that in in environments that are a little bit more high pressured I feel like sometimes there are uh, it's not necessarily I wouldn't say bullying I think that might be a little bit strong but um I, I find that there are some people that are kind of traumatic to be around you know um it's yeah of course yeah and 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 i feel like if you're in the industry as a creative um i feel like you wear a lot of their personality too if, if you're kind of on a day-to-day if you're dealing with them on a day-to-day basis um um i mean 
up until probably the last five or six years, probably when I actually moved into production design and supervising art directing and just running a department um, with the production designer, I've, I've, I have, I have found myself not struggling with anything, really. I think when you move into that production designer position, it becomes a little bit more lonely. You've got producers and directors that you're having to kind of impress and be front of house for an art department that you need to motivate. And I've, mm. I've found sometimes trying to balance that very, very difficult. I've, I've either got one thing right and not the other, or really failing at the other thing and, and getting the other bit kind of passing by with it. Sorry, just getting through with the other bit. So it's, I don't know. I, I found I found that that balance difficult, especially when you've got complicated people that you're kind of trying to trying to tease out what they want. Or, um, but I suppose that's the same in any in any kind of industry. Really, when you get to a kind of the the HOD of your department, you've got a number of different hats that you need to wear at different times. And I struggle to 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 change them. If you see what I mean. Yeah, no, clear. I, I, I most certainly do. And I think one thing that I, um, what happens is as you, I'm assuming you're in your mid forties, if I'm yeah, not wrong, 40, 40, right? Exactly. 44. Yeah. I think when you are in that time frame, um, so am I, uh, and you go through something. It, it, I think that a lot of people call it midlife crisis. I don't believe it's midlife crisis. It's called, for me, it's like finding a purpose, right? Like, what is the yeah. purpose of your existence? Yeah. yeah. Um, and and one of the key things that you talked about, it, it's, it's so bang on, is that when you are working in that environment and you're truly enjoying it, and then when you get out of that environment, even though it ha may have its you know, side effects of people with baggage and their attitudes and all that, that's anywhere in life. Um, you, when you come out of that and you feel I'm not around what I, I'm enjoying and you feel that what you feel, whatever that is, yeah. that emptiness and that. Um, and I think that sometimes it's a good thing because it being uncomfortable pushes you to figure out things that otherwise you probably won't. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I think because our jobs require us as production designers to be able to read a script and take a character and design an environment to suit that character, I feel we're so, um, we're so heightened in terms of trying to draw on what people are thinking or, or how, or how we're being perceived or how they think we sh they should be perceived. I feel like um we're incredibly astute at at uh, uh, at trying to understand um, people's characters yeah no it, it's true it, it's so true and it, it's 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 funny we're always telling stories you know whether you're a production designer art director music composer director writer editor cinematographers we're always trying to tell stories and in doing so in a very strange way we're either losing ourselves or we rediscovering ourselves yeah uh, ab absolutely yeah 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 I, yeah completely agree uh, you're always kind of going you're always going through that kind of change whether it's one thing or the other for sure and i and i also find depending on what the story that you're working on because every story is different to a certain extent right and uh, there's different and I said, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I said, every story is different and more or less, and the characters are different and their problems are different. And sometimes when you're working on something, sometimes, you know, you feel that, oh, I can relate to this. Right. Yeah. But yeah, there are yeah. other times when you don't know why you're relating to it, but you are. And that's, I think, when it becomes completely confusing or, and then you go in that you know thinking mode of thinking like millions of thoughts this 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 why 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 yeah. and then yeah but yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a struggle it's a struggle mm. um yeah no thank thanks for sharing that man i i wasn't expecting the conversation to go there but i appreciate that uh, your honesty and um yeah. and everything it's really cool I'm, for you to i'm not i'd only kind of 
I, I'd only been talking to um, there's a kind of guy that I, I speak to kind of, and have been speaking to for the last four or five years. And he kind of really helped me kind of unpack stuff like that. Um, so it's only something that I've really kind of acknowledged that I've been suffering from in the last couple of weeks, even though it's been plainly obvious to me, really, if I'd given it any kind of single thought that I was struggling a bit with it. So um, so uh, that's why it just came out, because it's kind of fresh in my mind. And I've recently been, pro you know, processing, unpacking and kind of moving forward with it. Um, um, but yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to overshare, sorry. No, 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 it's awesome. I'm glad you did because I think something that people, we, we should talk be talking about these things more often than just talking about work. You know you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Because the, like, that's how you connect with people and then that's how you yeah. connect to yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, talk and feel free to at any time in the conversation to share whatever you want. I, I thoroughly <laughs> felt it was very important. Um, but I, I think also in terms of your career, um, you know, what was the project? I know I, I went through your credentials. I mean, I obviously you've done Argyle, which we're here to talk about. You did Tetris um, for Apple, which I haven't seen. Uh, I always wanted to see it because of Tetris. You know, who doesn't know Tetris? Yeah. I just never ha haven't gotten around to it. But what would be the break that you would consider where you felt, oh, I, I there's no end to the break because you're always making a break. Yeah, you know, you're always you're always trying to go for better and bigger and to fulfill and all that. But what was that one project where you felt, I got it, I this um, is what I want to chase. Do you know what? I don't think it was a project. I think it was more a person. Um, I kind of, I was kind of, you know, for want of a better word, dicking about with a career that was fun in film um, for ten years, and I was, I kind of. I knew that I was very good. I enjoyed my time when I was an art director on set. Um, and I, I, I spent, I spent quite, a bit of, quite a bit of time on, on, on set. And then um, I worked with a lady called Susan Davis, um, who, who did Saltburn very recently. Um, okay. But I worked with her on Mr. Turner with Mike, for Mike Lee. And then Peter okay. Lou and loads of jobs in between. And we, she was really inspiring to work for as a production designer. And I really felt like with her more than any other designer that, you know, if we, if we knuckled down and, and, and worked hard, but enjoyed ourselves, that we would be able to kind of get there. We'd be able to kind of not just be languishing in, in UK domestic dramas, but we have to put our foot down and kind of accelerate into, into serious, um, nuanced stories with fantastic actors and directors. So I think it was kind of joining forces with her. And then we also joined with um, Charlotte Dirks, who's a set decorator who has done Salt Burn with, with Susie recently. She did True Detective with me actually in Iceland. Um, um, so it was kind of I found that my career found its feet when when I when I when I met Susie and and from then on kind of kicked into to actually me taking it a bit seriously. I kind of progressed through my thirties and thought actually I'm I'm quite good at this and I'm enjoying it and actually if I really work hard, um, I'd be really interested to see how far I can go. And then so I was very happy as a supervising art director until about six or seven years ago when. When a friend of mine who knew somebody at Neil Street, um, and they they did a thing called Britannia, um, mm. and they were looking for an art, uh, they were looking for a production designer, and Jethro, my friend, the location manager, kind of phoned and said, "Listen, I think you'd be great at it. Um, why don't you go and meet them?" Um, and I hadn't really kind of thought about it production designer because I was really enjoying my career with Susie and with Charlotte. I didn't really kind of didn't really think that I could do my own thing or kind of forge my own path. So I went to meet them. They offered me the job. And then I kind of haven't looked back, really. I kind of I did Britannia. And then I did a li lovely little film with Tony Collette called Dream Horse. From that, the director of Tetris saw Dream Horse and thought that um, the interiors for some of the characters was, were really beautiful. And he asked me to do Tetris. Tetris was um, produced by Matthew Vaughan and then he asked me on to do Argyle mm. and then um, 
and then from Argyle I went on to do True Detective. So it's been quite a kind of each each stepping stone in the last five or six years has been quite a big jump. Um, so uh, so that's so yeah, I, I would say in short, an answer to your question, it would be Susie, Susie Davies and Charlotte as opposed to a kind of a specific project. Got it. Um, moving on to Argyle, I'll come back to this conversation afterwards, but moving on to Argyle. <laughs> What was what was the process of working on this film in terms of the vision of uh, Matthew, Matthew's vision and bringing that to life? And, you know, it has a very distinct look. The film yeah. has a very distinct look. Um, well, what, was, what was that process like? Well, we... It was interesting because... Um, uh, the way that Matthew works is quite different from other other directors. I mean, every director is different, but I felt like the the, the process with Matthew was 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 more different than with others. Um, we knew that we weren't going to be shooting, certainly not main camp, main unit, in all of those places. Um, so we and I think we were just coming out of COVID, and and I think nobody really wanted to travel. With all of the COVID protocols set up in different countries, it was just going to be far easier if we built everything. Right. We built the main the main elements of whatever it was we were going to be photographing, and then you know that extended with with CG with CG guys in post. Um, so it was just very much like going through the script with Matthew, um, presenting to him um, reference of existing locations or spaces. Um, that that I thought would work for the scene. Some things I got I got nailed on. Uh, some things didn't didn't work out so well, and we had to go back to the drawing board and represent concept work and mood boards. Um, and then we were back and forth about the size of the size of the um, the build, the construction that we were going to do because there was so much. There were so many um, stunts. Uh, it was important that we understood where we were going to finish in terms of our set build and then where we were going to, where the CG guys were going to take over from in terms of what was going to be built digitally. Mm. So we had lots of physical versus digital kind of conversations with the CG guys. Um, um, and then once we'd kind of have a better understanding from Matthew about the size of the space that he wanted for, for the, for the scene, um, then we could kind of come back with, with set dressing ideas and, um, color palettes um and then work through with the director of photography george about you know what the color of the interior needed to be um or the lighting or, and, and the set dressing and and once once matthew had approved everything then we kind of set to building it i mean actually that was one thing that i one thing that i have that i learned from working with matthew that i will take on to every job whenever possible you know you can present them with a digital model, with a white card model, you know, directors I mean, and mood boards, but actually standing in a space, in the space, marking out the set on the floor, standing bits of flattage up so they have a better understanding of the height of the space. Um, I, think, I think it's really important because, you know, the less surprises on the day, the better, I think, when it comes to presenting a finished sure. set to the director. So, so, um, uh, and that wasn't something that I ever really did before. I kind of trusted in the process that the director would be able to understand the size of the space from just a model, a white card model or a digital one or a concept. But actually, I I found like I I was able to understand it a little bit more as it was being built physically. Um, uh, yeah, so I would say that really. Some sets were, some sets were troubling. Um, some sets didn't kind of come off the page as quickly as others. Some we mm. squared away really, really simply. Um, but there were others that were very complicated because they had, they had a requirement for large amounts of the set to be set up for stunt work. So we had to build kind of, sometimes we had to build two or three of some set because we knew that we needed to break at certain points. I mean, we built everything. We built the bookshop, we built the train, we built the Hong Kong flat, we built the French chateau. We, we shipped yeah. in Italian vines from Italy and planted nice. them for the French chateau. I mean, it was all just in the North, North London in a kind of, uh, there's a, a farm um, that uh, Marv, Matthew's company are kind of 
friendly with. They've shot quite a few of their productions there. Um, so there were, there's, you know, the Greek Taverna, we built that as well. And the, 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 the apartment block, the roof of it, that the jump off, we, we built that as well. I mean, it was extraordinary how much we, um, we, 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 we built from scratch. Um, yeah, no, it was good. I, I, I think I've, I don't think I've ever been on the production as kind of as construction heavy. I mean, we, we had to use three construction companies because not one would be able to kind of solve all of our, you know, would not be able to build all of the elements that we needed to get constructed. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was very busy, that job, very, very busy. That's good. What would be the one set that you think was the most, you said some were easy, some were difficult, some were challenging. If there was one particular setup that was the most challenging, whether it was logistics or space or lighting, whatever it was. The ice, the ice rink, I think probably. Okay. Um, um, I would say, uh, I mean, it was, it was so complicated. We we had a um, uh, a stunt arranger, a gentleman called Brad a um, Brad Allen, who unfortunately died whilst we were on the on the project. Um, he passed away very very sadly, and he was very close to Matthew. Mm. Um, I think he was. I think he was Jackie Chan's protege. Like like this guy's oh. like super cool. Um, and what he was doing, which was um, was which was pretty amazing. He was. Um, rehearsing the stunt sequences in, a, in LA with bodysuits on. So he was motion capturing the stunts. Um, we were then building the sets digitally in, in London, um, inputting them into Unreal, which is the game engine, yeah. taking the information from the motion capture stunt sequence, putting that into Unreal with our digital mocked up set and then we we were able to go in with vr headsets and walk around the motion captured stunt sequence being played out virtually in the environment that i designed so this kind of ah. i'd never been in an environment where or on a project where we could we were so kind of um leading the curve in well i mean I, i'm sure it's kind of moved on significantly since but it was just mind-blowing for me that you could put on a put on a vr headset and stand in our virtual space with the motion captured stunt sequence playing out in front of you i mean it was um, an extraordinary kind of meshing of all of those worlds um, um and then i think what we did is once the sequence was approved it was broken down or storyboarded um, so we knew what shot was going to last for how long. And then once we'd got a storyboard that everybody was able to move forward from, then we were able to build proxy elements of sets that they had to kind of dodge behind, jump over, um, um, fall against. So then each sequence basically was kind of shot individually and then and then it all stitched together and and um, the vis effects put over the top. So it was... Um, it was quite complicated it was there was lots of moving parts and um and and uh, there were yeah there were lots of people involved and it was um yeah it was it was tricky at times i think there were i think the sequence is fantastic is really really it, remarkable um it, 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 it was, was a bloody headache to get to that point well it, it it's always you feel always good about something that you struggle to make. And then you, when you see it at the finished project, it's like such an achievement, right? So, yeah. um, but it's interesting. You talked about the VR headset because, and when you were talking about, you know, in pre-production, trying to figure out uh, the pieces and the, the vision, the visuals and all that. And I was thinking, yeah. I was thinking at that time about the, the advent of, you know, AI, and how you can how you can now there's so many platforms where you can punch in a command and give detailed instructions and it would yeah. you know, generate something for you and then the combination of VR, I mean it's just amazing. At the same time, somewhat scarier where we're heading, you know, yeah. in terms of the technology. Do you see yeah. AI helping people? in your in in your sector not necessarily in the industry i mean i know people use it all the time like everybody uses chat gpt um, yeah, if yeah, i'm yeah. if i'm creating a deck i would try to generate some images as opposed to going out and you know 
finding some random stuff and that looks more yeah authentic, more more like branded kind of thing so do you yeah think that's gonna happen uh it's is it gonna affect what we do as, as in your job my job or anybody else i mean i think i think i think absolutely of course i don't think there's any way of kind of 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 trying to stop it i feel i feel like as as everybody is in every kind of industry that is is being affected by ai you kind of have to understand how it can improve it and what tools we as the head of department need to do to try and kind of make it as um worthwhile and as advantageous for us as possible i feel like i have a i have a concept designer um concept illustrator who I work with very closely who did uh, Argyle to Tetris to Tetris with me um, and I have an amazing relationship with, with that guy and I can send him over random bits of shit that I was thinking of I can send him over a color palette or even if I've just kind of screen grabbed something and send it across to him and he will he will because we have a shorthand will able to decipher these lap these kind of selection of cryptic messages and, and understand oh my god so that was what he was thinking about for that for the colorway for that and i'll i'll change this frame to suit this and i'll just give him a little heads up about a kind of certain torch light on true detective it was it was um very much about the kind of practical lighting that i'll just kind of send him through and he would get it immediately and send me back these fantastic kind of beautiful images that i was able to kind of waft under the, the director's nose and everybody would love them and we would move on and I, I feel like I I have such a good relationship with him and um I the thing that I would most worry about um is is losing that ability to have that kind of conversation. And and it feels like it's a bit more organic and I'm sure there's gonna be ways that um you know in the not too um distant future uh I'm gonna be able to do something very similar. But I still, I still think that there is, I don't know, there is there's something in a connection that you have with, with, or my connection with him that just generates an image, or he generates an image that's just, just slightly better, a little bit more organic. I don't know. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Feel, It's also, sorry, go on. Um, no, I think, I think that was, that was kind of it, really. I kind of, I, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what's around the corner in terms of. Um, how AI will help with production designers or um but I I I do worry for for the loss of that kind of human relationship. Yeah. And I think that the the right word for that and that I, I feel that during this pod anytime I do a podcast podcast episode is that that human connection knowingly or unknowingly becomes extremely therapeutic. Like it's just, Absolutely. it just, it just, it just does it, even you and I talking right now, right? Like there's just something about it, even yeah. though we're talking on zoom, obviously in person is going to be completely different, but yeah. just having that thing really yeah. helps us figure out on a very small scale who the hell we are. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's important. And I, but I, you know what I fear, I don't fear about our generation. I fear that, I don't even fear about the kids who grew up, who were born in early 2000s. I'm talking about people who have been born in the last 10, 15 years, like now are now teenagers. And yeah. that's what they're being born into. And then this, what we are talking about is normal for us. The technology part would be normal for them because that's yeah. what they just grew up in. I think that's yeah. where the the future is kind of, Glee, you know it's kind of like bleak in a way yeah 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 i think you're right um one of the things i wanted to ask you we were talking about this earlier i'm going to go back about trying to figure out the the purpose talk that we're having right uh, since we, we started that i just had this thought in my head when we were talking about it but i wanted to go to argyle is that I I don't know if you've ever seen this speech by Matthew McConaughey. I I don't. It was a beautiful speech at the Academy Awards. He won the Oscar. This was yeah, where he Oscar talks the about future thing. Yeah, where he talks about I'm always aiming to be someone I will be in ten years, and when I get there, and then it's like an ongoing process because I'm never going to be someone that I want to be. It's just like a yeah. constant journey, and yeah. I feel, and I sometimes feel, and I I don't know, I I could be dead wrong about this, is that I feel that. a lot of us 
start feeling the way we feel because we feel that we've always wanted to be someone. And when we get to that point, whether it's in terms of financing, whether it's in terms of careers, whether it's in terms of whatever, you just, re it's yeah. kind of like buying it. It's kind of like buying an iPhone, you know, and then a week later, like, okay, well, what was the point of that? Like, that's, that's all, you know, it felt good for like yeah. two weeks and that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if that's how it happens to all of us, that we feel that we're going to get to a certain point, we're going to be happy, but when we get there, we're happy for a limited amount of time, and then yeah, we want something else. Um, I I think without a doubt that is completely the case. Yeah, I mean, I, I think whether it is something as kind of materialistic as, as an iPhone or, or a kind of a level in a career you know i've you know the amount of um amount of times i've been kind of very jealously looking at another production designer on another bigger film and or somebody's doing a really really interesting project that i read the script for and i'm like fuck i would have loved to have been on that absolutely love to have been on that and but i and I don't mean to sound big headed, but coming off the back of Argyle, which was 150 million, and having just done True Detective, which which obviously, you know, dressing sure. sets for Jodie Foster, you're like, I just need to just take a little moment and 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 take stock of kind of where I've got to and and enjoy this kind of enjoy enjoy the journey, enjoy this process. And it, and actually, you know what, if I only ever do if, I, if there's only ever kind of do projects that aren't as successful as True Detective or aren't as fun as Argyle, then that's all okay too. But I think, I think we are, I feel like we are programmed to kind of, um, to kind of get up the ladder as quick as possible. Um, um, because, because I, I, I don't know, I mean, I think certainly when you get into this kind of the, the top tier of film and television, I think there is. I think we're all kind of pre-programmed to to do as bigger projects, or uh, to try and do as uh, as critically acclaimed shows as as possible. They're, you're striving for 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 some kind of um, accolade. I, I mean, it is interesting. You know, I kind of I I, I spent a, a a while wondering whether whether when you get into doing shows of this this size. Um, how motivated you are uh, about award season, and it was never really something that I'd given very much kind of thought to, just because I suppose I was never working in shows or on on projects that would potentially be up for awards. But ever since we did Mr. Turner with Susie, and there was um, you kind of got we got acknowledged, we got nominated for an Oscar for that. Um, there's always been some part of whatever job I take or whatever project I'm kind of reading. And I'm wondering about whether it is going to be, whether it would be something that would be considered for an award. Um, and I'm just battling because I, I'm not sure whether that is, that's not the reason why I got into film. But I wonder whether I'm so kind of caught up by this kind of feverish excitement to be on the bigger job or part of kind of embroiled into that illusion that we want to be on the bigger project a better project for more money with bigger actors that i i feel like it's almost like a byproduct and and um i I'm, i've been really kind of struggling with, with trying to remember why i like train spotting so much when i first did it you know and that wasn't definitely not oh, yeah. never thought yeah. of and, and the idea of being you know, being up for a BAFTA or an, an Oscar um, um, so yeah I, 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 I definitely do think there is um, you're always you're always looking over your shoulder to see what other people are doing when when you get to a kind of this, this level of filmmaking I think yeah yeah and I, and I, it's funny you mentioned that and I, I I'll tell you a story so before I tell you a story, one of the things that Christopher Nolan is known for that he doesn't have a smartphone, right? He he has a yeah. burner phone. I um, like that, yeah. Right? And which is about focus, but I'll tell you something, and I talk to this uh, to people that I know, especially my wife, um, about when I I started production 23 years ago, right? Like my whole thing, 
24 years ago when my whole thing is like director like this is what i want to do and i i am a director by you know by the yeah blessings of everything around me and everything and i'm working on films but getting to that point that i am right now there was a part of it's a very small example but i think i, I think about this all the time is that around 2000 and i would like to say nine i think yeah late 2009 um i was trying to figure out what to do with the production we were i was doing you know corporate jobs and here and there for other people i wanted to start my own business um so i started two companies one was mainly designed to produce branding videos for companies right and right. Uh, one was more so doing high end wedding cinematography around the world and okay wow and then between 2009 and 2013 the only thing that I was focused on was the work. I did not interact with the competition. I did not look what anybody else was doing. I was just so involved and yeah. I was doing great. Like in terms of, you know, financially business was great in terms of me enjoying it, me being in the moment and everything. It was fabulous. And then I got involved in a trade show, just trying to like take the business to a next level. Yeah. And my, my entire thinking turned upside down then i start looking at everybody yeah. else and yeah, i think yeah, yeah. that's that's the key which you said too it's like you just need to be so focused yeah on your own thing and forget about the external noise and it's really hard now because everything is right in front of us right yeah yeah and i think you know it's everything seems to be so geared up to the this award season that i think i think listening like turning down the noise being able to just do it for you or what you think it should be um is incredibly difficult um yeah i'm not yeah, quite sure what the solution is i i, I don't know whether I, I don't know whether i'd ever find a kind of a happy medium where i'm i i'm i'm completely settled in everything that i'm doing when i'm when i'm able to look at what everybody else is doing um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's challenging. Think it yeah, really challenging. Yeah. yeah, but I think that's a struggle with everybody, isn't it? I mean, I think it, is. it feels it is. like. Yeah, I know that. Um, yeah, I know. I know well, a few people that are kind of going through it at the moment, kind of very interested in in what other people are saying or doing, and it's um, and and I, and I don't. I believe you lose that focus, that that targeted approach to deliver what you what you only you do, only you want to to do. I think the old saying is so accurate, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? And when you when you start looking at around you instead of who you should be really looking at is your inner self. And I yeah. think that's when you lose the plot. I mean, like, come on, like like you know, we work we work on films and stories which are literally about these kind of stories. Is that how people who are who don't discover like you always find out a character discovering who they are. Yeah, right? yeah, and the yeah. like you know you film. I'm just kind of naming some films like Rain Man, A Few Good Men, you know, uh, I don't know Schindler's List, Forrest Gump. It's like trying yeah, to yeah, figure yeah. out yourself as opposed to the surroundings. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, what's yeah. next for you? Um, um. Uh, what's next for me? Well, there's a couple of, uh, to, to be really honest, um, as I kind of alluded to at the, the very first kind of question that you asked, um, I'm not doing a lot, to be really honest. There's 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 quite a few projects that have come by um, and whether the script wasn't kind of quite right or, um, or they were going to be shot in the, the other side of the world or not quite enough money for their level of ambition it hasn't just i just haven't found the right one yet and i i feel like i want to feel like now that i've got to a position where i feel really happy at in terms of type of production that i'm doing i want to be just a little bit more pickier however saying all of that um i need to work i haven't worked since april i owe money to the tax man i'm getting married this year that requires a bit of cash like I need to, I need to do something. There's a couple of commercials on the um, on the horizon that I'm chasing. One one would be really lovely to do. There's a few scripts um, 
there yeah there's, there's there's a few things but nothing nothing set in stone yet okay um what's one thing again this is not trying to have draw comparisons or anything like that but if is there a, a dream project in your head even if it's something that will never get fulfilled that you would like to do um um whether it's know, working I, with the director whether it's working in yeah, a particular country or my um my my girlfriend um fiance is working for Guillermo del Toro um and a production designer called Tamara I think he pronounced his surname Devrel I think um, okay. and they're doing they're doing Frankenstein at the moment he did Nightmare Nightmare Alley which just blew me away in terms of its production design I mean I I I would say designing Frankenstein for Guillermo del Toro is probably probably one of the ones that are uh, would be up there I think um certainly kind of some of the conversations that I've been earwigging to that my girlfriend's having with the art and sound exciting really 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 I can't wait for that movie um um and you know what I I honestly believe that um uh having the opportunity to design um recreate Alaska in Iceland for Isa and design interiors that Jodie Foster is going to be inhabiting I mean that's 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 pretty up there really I think I think um I was I was very fortunate to be allowed on to on to on to doing True Detective um and actually you know what um Argyle Argyle was 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 a it was a pretty outstanding opportunity as well. You know, Sam Jackson, Bryce Dallas Howard, Brian Cranston, Matthew Vaughan. I mean, it's a stellar, stellar kind of cast and crew. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm getting, I'm, 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 a, I'm achieving what I, I, w I would have, I would have only ever dreamed to have got to a level you know do you, do you see what i'm i feel like i'm kind of yeah yeah yeah. i get it i feel like i'm i feel like i'm there but but um uh yeah but you're not there yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but um but Guillermo del toro that would be that would be dreamy i think or or and if you know just, just denny villeneuve wow i mean that guy's exceptional too i mean that would be extraordinary to be on a project with him him or Guillermo. I mean, I'd be happy one or the other, really. Yeah, and, and you said your your fiance uh, or girlfriend is working on that as a production designer. No, she's as an art director. So art Tamara director. Devrel or Dev Devrel, I think, is the production designer. She did Nightmare Alley with him. I think she was. I think she also did Shape of Water, but I'm not. I'm not 100 percent certain about that. But um, okay, I uh, was. I was blown away when I looked. I watched her work on. Um, Nightmare Alley with with Guillermo. That was I thought that few, that film was stunning, absolutely stunning. I gotta check um, that out. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a, it is really stunning. Great, awesome. Well, exciting. Um, I I really hope that you know things take a turn, and I think it's part of our journey to discover who the heck we are when we go through these kind of difficult times. I think um, you're right. And, uh, you know, it, for sure you'll come on top. I mean, I'll give you, leave you with one story. I don't know if you know this guy named Gary V. You probably have heard of him. Yeah. Okay. He said something. So his, his dream always, he, to kind of sum it up, it's a great story. He, when he migrated to Canada, uh, sorry, not Canada, U.S., uh, I think he was from Ukraine, and they were okay. having a really hard really hard times like this was in the 80s and they could barely you know survive on three meals and he was a really big fan of new york jets um the football team and yeah. uh so he wanted to buy a jersey but didn't have the money so his mom like knitted him a jersey <laughs> like a sweater and uh, and and he kept that jersey to this day and he said if I want, I can buy New York Jets tomorrow. But I don't want to do that because if I've done that, then the purpose of what I have is fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I can probably do that way down the road when I yeah, feel yeah, yeah. 
So I think that's the key of wanting what you want, but sometimes not getting what you want all the time sometimes leaves you empty and yeah. well, having lovely, always... Yeah. This is a great story and, and, and really kind of, yeah, anecdotally kind of what we've been talking about, you know, you kind of be careful kind of not what you wish for really, but just, just make sure that you don't kind of, I don't know, enjoy the journey, enjoy the process. Um, Pretty much. Um, rather than, rather than, yeah. 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 The, this, this has been one of the most awesome conversations I've had, Daniel. Thank you so much for being Thank so you. open I about it. I um I've I've loved it. I've really loved kind of ch chatting. It's been good. Um, um, let me know if there's anything that you want to go, kind of go over uh, over again or nor need kind of clarification. I'd be more than happy to to jump up on a call with you. It's been it's been really good. What's what's yeah, your no, process? How how are you gonna you're gonna edit it? Are you and then gonna um, how does it work? Or so honestly, what we do is. <laughs> we try not to edit anything unless there is like, you know, if, if there was like an audio blip or you had to take a break or something. Yeah. Um, but we just try, like, literally we just put it out there from beginning yeah. to end and, and then let, and it goes on Spotify, it goes on Apple, it goes on YouTube and yeah. Yeah. So and just, and, yeah. yeah and let people just discover it and push it and promote it as much as we can on our end. And, you know, it's been, it's been good so far because, a lot of people it's just it's just it's just again it's therapeutic people don't realize it but we all love making that connection i think especially yeah. after covid things have really messed up people to a level that it requires a lot of healing uh, everyone all of us and, I, I, I couldn't uh, agree more i think we i think the the trauma that we've all gone through is kind of i don't really think that we fully kind of understand or appreciate kind of how much repair we need to do and 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 the only way that we can is by by, by having these these interactions by by kind of you know this therapy i think um yeah and that is you know connecting with people for sure I, I i don't think i've spoken so freely with anybody on a on a on a on a podcast before um certainly not about my kind of slightly questionable <laughs> mental state at the moment but um i i but, think um, a lot of people can relate to it yeah but yeah. I would love to talk to you again, maybe about Tetris, uh, maybe about True Detective, maybe both. Let's let's do that again. Let's. Uh, yeah, I gotta absolutely. See it's been a pleasure. It really, really has. Sincerely. So, um, uh, yeah, if you want to catch up about True Detective or or Tetris, I'm I'm I'd be more than happy to just jump on another call with you for sure. Perfect. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate your time, Dan. You too. Take care. Have a great day. See you soon. You All too. The best. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share and comment and do come back for another episode. Until then, have a great day.